Let's look at an example having to do with virtual machine security. So Microsoft has a technology called virtualization based security, and it uses the hardware support for virtualization that exists on all modern systems in order to provide a separated or isolated area of memory in which they can run what they call the secure kernel. So they've got the normal kernel on one side, they've got the secure kernel on the other side. And they refer to the one running the normal kernel as virtual trust level zero. So in their terminology, zero is a lower number and so it's less trusted. And virtual trust level one is the secure kernel. For all intents and purposes, when a normal user is using the system, they don't notice any difference. They just see the typical kernel. But uh, behind the scenes, there can be this other isolated secure kernel. And so this particular vulnerability that we're going to be looking at has to do with ACID handed from the VTL0 kernel over to the VTL1 kernel. So it's specifically going to be in what they call a secure call. So if normally you have a system call between you know, apps and platform services into the kernel or a hyper call into the hypervisor, they call this the secure call from the non-secure kernel to the secure kernel. And despite the fact that this picture sort of makes it look like, you know, maybe this one's running in one VM and that one's running in a different VM, they are actually running in the same VM and it's just using the hypervisor's capability for memory isolation to isolate the security critical code over here. Now, the fact that there's acid flowing from a low trust to a high trust region means that this is an attack surface. This secure call mechanism should basically be treated as untrustworthy data coming in from the less secure kernel. But of course, if you want to think about attack surfaces, really everything should be, you know, treating everything else as, you know, attacker controlled. The secure kernel shouldn't trust the normal kernel. The hypervisor shouldn't trust the normal kernel. The apps shouldn't trust each other. The secure kernel shouldn't trust this other code running to integrity check this code over here. So attack surfaces are everywhere and that's why you need to program paranoid because it's not paranoia if they really are out to get you. So anyways, architecturally, the point of splitting the VTL1 kernel and the VTL0 is to reduce the attack surface on the VTL1. So the expectation is that, you know, these days the normal Windows kernel is extremely large it's basically indefensible from the perspective of there's just so much legacy code, you know, millions and millions of lines of code. And therefore, if you have truly security critical functionality, it will be broken out and placed into the VTL1 kernel so that that with a much more reduced attack surface can handle the security critical functionality and hopefully will be less uh, easy to break into. So again, the VTL1 kernel should be distrusting everything, including inputs coming from the VTL0 kernel. Now we're going to see MDLs a couple of times in this class for different, different examples. And for this particular exploitation, the MDLs are going to be critical. So MDLs are memory descriptor lists, and they're what Microsoft calls a semi-opaque data structure, meaning that officially this is not all documented, only a couple of fields are documented and have official APIs. But, you know, of course, uh, people have reverse engineered things and they know generally how it behaves. So when you think about MDLs, I want you to think about the notion of there's a fixed structure at the beginning of the MDL, this MDL struct. And then after the structure is a variable length array of pointers. And these pointers are pointers to what are called frames or, you know, physical frames. These are hex 1000 size chunks of memory which are you know, defining the overall memory descriptor list and how it looks. There's going to be a offset field in the MDL that says where the actual memory that's going to be declared starts from within these frames. And then there's going to be a byte count that indicates what the total size of this described memory is. So overall, that is going to be the described memory. The MDL has got this structure as essentially a header. It's got some array, a variable sized array of frames, however many frames, however many hex 1000 chunks of data are needed to describe the MDL. And then this is going to describe the overall structure. So this is you know, how it would look in struct form. And this is how it looked in the uh, research that we're going to be talking through. And so here you've got that next pointer at the beginning, that's you know, eight bytes, assuming a 64-bit architecture, two byte size, two byte flags, et cetera. And then after this fixed size structure at the beginning is going to be the variable length array of what I called page uh, P frame 
and then a number, and what Microsoft calls PFNs, page frame numbers. So PFN0, PFN1, etc. They're addresses of physical frames, of physical memory, as opposed to virtual memory. So this MDL has to do with its data that's going to be transferred from the uh, insecure kernel, from the VTL0 kernel to the secure kernel. And all of these content are ultimately going to be attack controlled values when they're passed from the VTL0 kernel to the VTL1 kernel. And you know we're assuming here that the VTL0 kernel has been completely compromised and the attacker is now trying to you know, break into whatever security functionality exists over in the secure kernel world. So the attacker controls all of this. They're not going to control the mapped system VA. So the, um, the secure world is going to be able to control that and set that. But the, at the end of the day, this map system VA is just a virtual address that is going to point at the data contained, with all of, contained within all of these uh, frames that are given by the array at the end. So even though the attacker doesn't control the actual address, if you see that used, it is actually just uh, a virtual address that points at attacker controlled data. All right, so here is some pseudocode that was given in the presentation. We've got uh, some code that the first thing that it's doing, this is on the secure kernel side of the world. On the secure kernel side, the first thing it does is it maps this uh, data transfer that's coming from the VTL0 kernel into the VTL1. And so I'm going to just tell you that this data MDL and this transfer PFN, which we don't care as much about, we're just gonna say that this, this is gonna be the input and this is going to be the output. So this is just essentially mapping it so that the physical addresses, the information that the, the insecure kernel told the secure kernel about will become available to the secure kernel via this transfer MDL. So data in, data out, and then this is tainted. And then I want you to go ahead and look at the source code to figure out what the implications of that tainted data are and where there's the potential for a heap buffer overflow. Also gonna tell you just that this last little thing that looked like a function at the end of that code, the mm initialize MDL, is not actually a function, it's a macro, and it's just going to initialize fields within the MDL, the memory descriptor list that is passed to it. So with that, go look at the code.